Good morning. Welcome to all of you today. A welcome especially to those of you that might be visiting with you uh, with us today. And if you are, we're glad to see you. And please sign our guest book today before you go home uh, as well. Today we're celebrating the fifth Sunday of Pentecost, or the fifth, fifth Sunday of Easter. And the focus is on how we believe in a risen Jesus, but how that truth of his death and resurrection, the forgiveness that we have, uh, motivates us then to produce the fruits of the faith, the good works that we do, uh, not to earn salvation, but in love for all that God has done for us through Jesus' death and resurrection. We're also going to welcome two of our members into communicant membership this morning as well in the confirmation vow a little later on. We'll open our service today with a singing of our first hymn. Please stand. Today we'll worship the one true God by using the common service, which is on the screen, or it's also on page 15 uh, in the red covered hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on us, Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. 
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson today comes from, to us from the New Testament book of the Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. It's a traditional during Easter to often read rather than for the first lesson, an Old Testament lesson, but uh, a reading from the New Testament book of Acts to show how the blessing of the resurrected Lord inspired that early church. And today we read the story of Philip and the Ethiopian showing now how the gospel of Jesus reaches to another culture and to another continent. We read from... Acts 8, beginning in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started off, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of, the, of Kandaki, which means queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was, on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. And Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the, the eunuch was reading. He was led like a lamb, led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Who can stand in the way of my being baptized? 
and he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of our God. We continue with Psalm 67 on page 91. to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. May your ways be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God our God will bless us. Our second scripture lesson today comes to us from one of the letters of the Apostle John, written quite late uh, in the Christian church, uh, reminding us, of course, that uh, faith alone saves us, but of course, the knowledge that Jesus has died and risen to give us the forgiveness of sins leads us then to love one another as God has also loved us. We read from 1 John 3, beginning in verse 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's command lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. This is the word of our God. Please stand for the gospel lesson. The verse of the day we read, followed by the singing of the Alleluias. The Lord God is with us. He is always with us. Let his rest rest upon us. The Holy Gospel for today is written in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. John, beginning in the first verse. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We join now in confessing what we believe the Bible teaches about the triune God by speaking together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the singing of our next hymn. Please be seated. Oh. 
shepherd watching all your lambs and sheep. Christ the gate that guards the sheepfold, never failing vigil keep. When we stray, good shepherd, seek us, find us, lift us of God, our shepherd, keep us, let us hear your voice alone. Christ, the way that leads unfailing to the Father's home on high, Christ, the truth that frees the captive, Christ, the life that cannot die. Mediator, shepherd, father, sacrifice, and great high priest, lead us to your heavenly mansions, there to share your wedding feast. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad, be glad in it. The word of God that we use today is from 1 John chapter 3, and I, we read this before, but I would like to read just the first, four, first verse for you again. Dear children, let us love not only with word or with our tongue, but also in action and in truth. This is the word of our God. Dear brothers and sisters, and especially you, the confirmants today on this day of confirmation, you probably remember a time maybe when your children maybe acted badly on Thanksgiving Day. Maybe they were two years old and they threw a little bit of a temper tantrum or maybe they acted selfishly with one of their cousins. And on the way home, you felt kind of bad as a parent. You felt like you'd kind of failed, like it was your kid that was the naughty one that day. That's a good illustration of how our hearts sometimes condemn us. They make us feel bad for things that we uh, feel inadequate about. Or sometimes we maybe think of how we acted as children. We think of how we acted as teenagers. We think of what we did to our little brother or little sister. And sometimes we start to feel kind of bad a little bit about that. How could I have done that? How could I have said those things? Uh, why didn't I talk to that person before they passed away? These are examples of sometimes how our hearts can condemn us. And today, in a letter that the Apostle John writes as a very old man, uh, he addresses some of those issues in a, in a very deep uh, letter, but at the same time, a, a very simple letter of what do we do when we fail as Christians to live the kind of life that we know we should live? And we're sometimes filled with doubts about, well, if I'm a Christian, why am I acting the way I am sometimes? Um, John addresses that for us today. And he encourages us to love one another, to produce the fruit of our faith, as he talked about in the gospel, as Jesus talked about in the gospel that John recorded, and that we love one another not only in ac action, but also in truth. And that serves as the basis for our discussion today. Love one another, love in action and in truth. We're going to see the truth, and we're going to see the action. This book of the Bible is probably one of the last books to be written about a hundred or so years after the birth of Jesus. Uh, it wasn't written into any particular congregation like many of Paul's letters were. It was written to, to Christians spread all, all across the Mediterranean Sea area. And there was a couple of things going on. First of all, there was a, a rise in persecution that was going on for Christian. 
But worse than that was some internal things that were happening in the church. There were some false teachers that were rising up in all of the Christian churches in the Christian church at that time. And they taught several things. Um, they taught the idea that Jesus really wasn't true God. He was someone like God, but he really wasn't true God, equal to the Father. Um, they taught in congregations that uh, how we live really isn't all that important anymore. It's how much knowledge we have. And they taught that it didn't really matter um, the works that we did, how we loved one another, as, as long as we had this great knowledge of Scripture and other writings as well. And because that false teaching was destroying people's faith, the Apostle Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to write this particular letter. And this is what he says. Dear children, let us love not only with word or with tongue, but also in action and in truth. Paul, of course, or the Apostle John, of course, addressed this idea of doesn't matter how we live. And he said, it, it does matter how we live. We can't just talk about loving people and being kind to people and doing good to people who need our help. We can't just talk about those things. He said, love in action and in truth. How we live, the things that we do, the things that we don't do still are important. Granted, those things don't save us. They don't get us to heaven, but they are still important. Paul said we need to love one another. We need to love in truth. And the truth is, is that God has every right to condemn us for our many failings. But he sent his son, Jesus, into this world, and he punished him when he died on the cross, brought forgiveness. And not only that, he also raised Jesus from the dead. And everyone has forgiveness, and believers continue to have forgiveness in that crucified and resurrected Lord. That is the truth. John said, and we want to love others on the basis of that truth that he has taught us in Christ. But here's also another terrible truth. What believer can say, I've always loved others as much as Jesus wants me to? What believer could say, I've done all the things that Jesus wants me to? And that leads us into a little bit of a predicament sometimes. Paul goes on, or John goes on to say this. This is how we know that we are the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Believers, of course, when they compare themselves to what God demands in his will about how they love others consistently and forgive others consistently, uh, often are led to realize they fall far short of what God demands of them. And their heart often condemns them. They know how they're supposed to live. They know how they are to act, but often they do not. And they sometimes are bothered by that. They worry about that. But John said this. He says, God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything, even when our hearts condemn us. And so when a believer looks at himself and sees his heart, points out his anger and his temper and his lack of love in his life, and he's filled with, that's his heart condemning him. John says in those times as Christians, we don't want to listen to our heart. We want to listen to our God. We want to listen to the truth that he has told us. He says God is greater than our heart. He knows everything. God knows everything about us. He knows every shameful detail in our mind and hearts and in our lives and in our past and what's going to be there in the future too. But God has told us a wonderful truth and that is the truth that he sent his son to die even for weak believers like you and me who sometimes fall short of what he demands. God knows everything. God knows that many times believers aren't sinning willfully or intentionally. He knows that believers are sinner saints. We're, we're, we're saints in that we know who Jesus is. We believe in him. But we're also at the same time, we're still sinners. And we still fall into sin every day. And, and you would agree with me, most of the time we're more sinner than saint, aren't we? And God knows this. And when our heart condemns us, he wants us to know the truth that he forgives us again and again in a day on the basis of this horrible death and this wonderful resurrection, wonderful resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us and he rose again. 
That's the truth, John says. And we want to love others on the basis of that truth. God's undeserved love leads us to love others in the same way as well. Now, uh, Carter and Dylan, what if your mother and father only loved you when you behaved yourself growing up? Otherwise, the rest of the time, they didn't like you very much. Or what if they only fed you and clothed you when you did all the things you were supposed to do? Well, you probably would have went hungry a few times in your life, probably, huh? But they loved you even in those times when you didn't act the way that God wanted you to. And more importantly, they've taught you about a God who loves us even when we sometimes fall short of what he demands of us. And they brought you to learn about him didn't he? They, through confirmation classes and through education, all these things, through Sunday school and Lutheran school. You've come to know a wonderful God who loves us even when we fail. And they would want you, and our congregation would want you to remember that, make sure that that God is always the most important part of your life as you go forward from this point on. All of us are filled with a sense of regret, aren't we, over things in our life. And we know we're not supposed to lose our temper and we're not supposed to say unkind things to one another. And yet again and again, what often happens in our lives? We fall into those things, don't we? And our hearts condemn us. Now, bear in mind, God doesn't overlook our sin. And it's not that he doesn't care about our temper and the times that we let curse words and swear words fly out of our mouth. He does care about those things, and they matter to him. One of them all by itself is enough to send us to eternity in hell, isn't it? But God loved us so much, he loved us with action, that he sent his son, and he punished him instead of you and me. And our heart still sometimes condemns us for those failings, but John wants us to listen to God and not to our heart. And we have a God who loves us every day in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our failings. And we go to him again and again, seeking that truth, knowing that he loves us and that he forgives us each day, even though we often fall short. And now we know the truth and now we want to use that truth also to love one another with actions. The Apostle John goes on and he says this, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We also receive from him whatever we ask because we keep his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. God forgives us every day. He forgives us on the basis of his son's death and resurrection. And when we live in the light of that forgiveness, our hearts no longer condemn us. In fact, John says we have, we have confidence with God. We don't have to be afraid of God. We don't have to run away from God. We, we can go to God confidently. We can ask him in our prayers for whatever we want. And we know that he's always going to answer our prayers and he's going to answer them in his good and gracious way. We have confidence when we approach God, even though our heart may say otherwise. And for that reason, then, we also now can love one another. John says something kind of interesting. He says he, he, he'll give us whatever we ask because we keep his commandments and do what is pleasing in his sight. And that might at first think, well, he's only going to answer my prayers when I do what he wants, when I live my life perfectly. And that means he's often not going to hear me or answer me. But what is... God's will? Is it only just doing these individual good works? Or is there more to God's will than that? Look at what John says next. This then is his command, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another just as he commanded us. You see what God's will is? It isn't just that we do good. Is it that we believe in his son? with a heart of faith. That in that son's death and resurrection, we have the forgiveness of sins. That's, that's his will. And his will is that we see this wonderful truth that he punished his son in our place and that he forgives us every day in spite of our weaknesses. And now, knowing what God has done for us in Christ, who loves us in spite of our weaknesses, that we also would love one another 
in spite of their weaknesses, in spite of their faults, in spite of their failings, to love them as God has also loved us as well. In fact, as we go forward, trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and striving to love one another in the same way, we begin to realize that God truly does love us as we carry that out. John says this, the one who keeps his commands remains in God and God in him. This is how we know that he remains in us. We know it from the spirit whom he has given to us. As a believer lives his life, knowing that he wants to follow God's command, and the greatest command of all is to believe that he has the forgiveness of sins in the God-man, Jesus Christ. He then is led by the Spirit to not only believe that, but also to carry that out in action. He knows the truth, and he loves with action, as God has loved him with action as well. And the Holy Spirit leads them to understand this more and more, that they are God's dearly loved children, even though they don't always act like God's children. As they love with action, imperfectly, of course, one another, they grow through the power of the Holy Spirit to understand more that wonderful truth that God has given to us and also to love in action as well. And so sometimes... You and I, we get a little defensive, don't we, with one another? Maybe our spouse points out a fault of ours and we get kind of mad at them, but we kind of know in our heart that's really true. We kind of are that way. Or our sister or our brother points out something to us and we get kind of mad at them, but we kind of know in our heart, yeah, that's kind of something I do sometimes. It's not very nice. Or we think of old sins, of past sins, and then we try to, we try to justify, you know, like, well, I had a right to get mad, or, or, you know, it wasn't as bad as what others said. We, we do that. And then sometimes we start to maybe pick at and point out all the faults and the weaknesses of other people around us. We don't always love with action. And I think that many times we don't love with action and have love for other people because we don't always understand the truth. The truth is, no matter how good I've acted in my life and how much good I've done, I deserve to go to hell. That's the truth. And all of us do. But God loved us so much that he sent his son and he punished him in his place, in our place, and we're forgiven. And daily he forgives us. That's the truth. And now it's God's will that we would love one another, not only understanding that truth, but also now with actions, patiently bearing with one another, patiently bearing those mistakes that others do, those sins, those failings that they have, that we love them too, as God has loved us. That we love one another, John says, that we do that in truth and in action. Amen. Please stand. Now may God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us or forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in all his ways. Amen. We'll join now in singing, Create in me a pure heart. Congregation may be seated. I'll ask our two confirmants to come forward to be received into communicant membership at our congregation. Ready to go. Ready to go. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. 
In obedience to the Lord's command, you've been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You've been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you. You can now exercise the privilege of partaking of Holy Communion. You are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge that in baptism God gave you the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? If so, answer, I do. Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? If so, answer, I do. Do you believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary? suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? Do you, if so, answer, I do believe. Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? If so, answer by saying, I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you've learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the word of God? If so, answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Do you intend faithfully to conform all of your life to the teachings of God's word, to be faithful in the use of word and sacrament, and in faith and action to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as long as you live? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Since it is God alone who enables us both to will and to do his good pleasure, it is right for us dear friends in Christ, to call on him for these confirmands that he would graciously complete the good work which he has begun in them. Let us therefore bow our heads and pray. And we bow our heads. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith and mercy, you joined this, these two brothers to your church when they were born again of water and of spirit. In your mercy, you taught them your saving truth, grant that they may offer themselves as living sacrifices to you as their spiritual act of worship. Transform them by the renewing of their minds so that they will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Dear members of the confirmation class, what we as a Christian congregation have here asked our Heavenly Father to confer on you all we now ask him to grant you singly, each and every one. Carter Joseph Clagus, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you his Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, of grace and prayer, of power and strength, of sanctification and the fear of God. And Carter, your special Bible passage for this confirmation day, uh, Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Dylan Thomas Sandgren, may God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, steadfast, and keep you through faith for eternal life. And Dylan, your special passage for this confirmation day, uh, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever.
Your church now invites you to partake of the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. Regard your communing at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given you by God through his church. Receive this sacrament thankfully and often. The almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and keep you. Congregation is asked to please stand for prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you grew up in the home of Joseph and Mary, and as a 12-year-old boy sat among the teachers in the temple courts, listening to them and asking them questions. We give thanks for the mothers and fathers and teachers and pastors who have taught us when we were boys and girls to know and love you. Bless parents and teachers today as they lead children to trust you as their beautiful Savior and to follow them for the rest of their life. Lord Jesus, you chose 12 disciples to be with you and to become like you. Reveal sacred truth to them and send them on as your apostles into all the world. We give thanks for the many opportunities you give us day after day to grow in your holy word, opportunities that assure us of forgiveness in your constant presence. And Lord Jesus, though, though you have ascended into heaven, you still guide your church as our great prophet. Give to our pastors and teachers the knowledge to proclaim the good news. We give thanks for the blessings that we enjoy in the public ministry of the church. Continue to stir the hearts of young men and women to consider service in the church's ministry a great joy and an uncommon privilege. Give us faithful servants of your word who will adorn their office with godly lives. And Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, you are the author of life and death. We thank you for all the mercies which you've blessed our fellow believer, uh, Arlene uh, Miklos, who passed away this past week. Uh, we thank you for having provided her with the knowledge of your son, Jesus. We pray that you would continue to comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises. Cheer them with a sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant to her lifeless body rest and at last together with us all a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever living Lord. And we pray the prayer that you have taught us our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we'll continue with the order of Holy Communion uh, following on the screen or on page 21 in your hymnals. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you especially for the glorious resurrection of your Son, the true Passover Lamb, who by his sacrifice took away the sins of the world and by his resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, and the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. We continue with the order of service. We'll continue with the song of Simeon on page 24. Please stand. give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, almighty God, that you refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. We conclude our worship with our final hymn. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you again today. I was asked to read uh, a letter uh, here to address to your congregation uh, from Pastor Jason Libano. Um, Dear family in Christ, after receiving a divine call on April 11th, 2021, to serve God's people at St. John's in Fairfax, Minnesota, and Emmanuel at Wellington Township, Minnesota, as their pastor, I spent the last three weeks praying and deliberating. I write to you now to return this call. 
with confidence in Christ's rule and management over his church. I pray that he will continue to give you all that you need and more according to his good and gracious will. God's richest blessings to you, uh, Pastor Jason Liebenau. Thank you. You guys want to come back and shake it?